What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast, CBS Sports Daily NFL Podcast. I'm Will Brinson. I'm your host, and it is time to preview the Thursday night football behemoth of a matchup between two teams in Florida. I call this the um, – this is like the Prisco-Brady Bowl because Brady's a South Florida guy, Brady Quinn, and Pete Prisco is a, a South Georgia guy, North, North Florida guy, Jacksonville. And it's Jaguars versus Dolphins. Bring it on. We have a Florida, a Florida man in his own right. Don't you dare. <laughs> RJ White, uh, great friend of the program, of course. RJ, what's up, buddy? Not much. Excited for tonight's game. You can't, can't wait. You know, uh, you, you said before, don't complain about these games. We didn't know if we were going to even have football, you know, several weeks ago, a few months ago. So give me Dolphins Jag. Give me all the Dolphins Jag on a Thursday night. I'm so happy for it. Okay, so I joked because, like, last week on the Bengals Browns game, it was like, you know, they do the NFL, it's NFL Network in their preview. It's like, next Thursday, Minshew, Fitzpatrick, it's Thursday night football in Jacksonville. And it's like, how did that, did that guy record that preview? Did he record that promo, like, without laughing? Because that's really impressive. If so, and, and Jaguars fans and Dolphins fans got mad at me because, you know, that's what they do. <laughs> I wasn't saying I'm not excited about the game. It's just ridiculous to, like, promote it that way. I'm kind of excited about this game. This, these defenses stink, and the offenses are kind of fun and crazy. Like, you, could, you can picture a world where Minshew is sort of like Ryan Fitzpatrick's, like, you know, you, like Ryan Fitz, can, you, can you see Ryan Fitzpatrick looking in a mirror and, and maybe seeing Gardner Minshew? That's not out of control, right? Yeah, if we find out that uh, Gardner Minshew is somehow uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick's long lost son, you know, it wouldn't surprise anyone because he, <laughs> yeah, he could just come in and throw the ball all over the place and win games. And we think that at some point he's going to start, you know, losing some games if he's going to have that Fitz magic, Fitz tragic split that that Ryan Fitzpatrick has. Um, but it's been working so far. You know, looking good. They could have won both their games. They didn't. But um, yeah, Jacksonville's a better team than we gave him credit for before the season. Well, there's a little bit of uh, heat. Between the two. All right, so as you can hear, RJ, the, uh, the battle of the facial hair. Uh, Minshew, Ryan Fitzpatrick pointed out that the people who have mustaches means they probably can't grow thick, furry, luxurious hair on their cheeks. And Gardner Minshew uh, replied by saying, I won't make fun of my elders, especially when they're really, really, really old. Uh, I like it. I mean, I really do think that um, those two guys, I'd like, I, I feel like they would be buddies. Now, maybe the age difference is too much. And Minshew, like, you know, Fitzpatrick's got like nine kids and Minshew has like nine girlfriends. Maybe it's just not going to work. But, um, you know, I get, I, I, there's a little spirit animal factor here. I feel like definitely, you know, once their playing days are over, once we have some free time and we can start making movies again, get those two in a movie together and and you could throw any type of script at it, you know, whatever type of Will Ferrell-ish type comedy. And (laughs) that dynamic between those two, very Step Brothers-esque, you know, it'd be be a good movie to watch. Ooh, that's a good Photoshop. We get the uh, Pick 6 podcast social team or the CBS Sports social team on that. A little Step Brothers action. I might drop Joe Polito a note right now. Let's talk gambling on this game, though. The Dolphins uh, at the Jaguars. There will be fans there. I saw uh, Jane Slater of NFL Network report on Thursday morning. The Jaguars are expecting 17,000 fans. That is uh, – that's a lot. That's a lot of fans. And um, that's – I think that's probably a reasonable home field advantage. Uh, Jane pointed out that multiple players told her um, – Minshew and LaVisca Chenault both told her that, you know, the fans did provide, you know, a, a boost for the Jaguars uh, in week one when they played the Colts and, and pulled out a victory. The Jags are minus three. The over under is 48. Jaguars minus 160 on the money line. Dolphins plus 140. Uh, where do you go first uh, with this game, knowing that uh, Byron Jones out with a groin injury? Um, DJ Chark questionable. We won't, we'll know later about him in the day. Brandon Linder and Josh Lambeau both out as well. Yeah, you wanted to go over when this opened at 45. It's actually up to 48 and a half as of Thursday morning. Um, I don't know if I could play it, you know, over at 48 and a half. Um, it seems like the easiest way to look in this game. You expect a lot of points, but when you could have gotten 45 earlier in the week, it's hard to play 48 and a half. So I don't think there's value there, but that would be the way I lean. It's hard to see Miami stopping Minshew and James Robinson, but and I don't trust that Jacksonville defense. I think they'll give up a lot of points as the season goes along. They're kind of the AFC counterpart to the Panthers, a team with an offense that can score points and a defense 
defense that can give up points. And um, there was in the primetime games last year, there wasn't a lot of scoring early in the year. And it became this trend of always take the unders in primetime games. Well, there's been a lot of scoring in the last four uh, games on Thursday night football. Um, I think they're beating the, the total by 13 points. So just because it's a short week, don't um don't expect that this game you know has to go under um and we could still see the residual effects of that being week three and no preseason of defense is still not being quite there so over seems like the the best play in this the the number of three seems right where it should be um I don't love it. I'm, I mean, it's the juice is on Miami right now. If it gets to two and a half, I would look to Jacksonville. Um, I do think they're the better team overall. Uh, Miami struggles in prime time. Uh, so does Ryan Fitzpatrick. You know, we have some stats here that uh, Miami's on a four game losing streak straight up and against the spread on Thursday night football. Uh, Miami's five fourteen and one against the spread in prime time games since 2010. Um, it's the second worst mark since Houston and Fitzpatrick himself is four and 10 against the spread since he debuted uh, on prime time. So this seems like a place to fade Miami fade Fitzpatrick play on Minshew has been playing really well. Miami's given up the highest passer rating in the league should be a big game for Minshew. So my lean would be to Jacksonville, but wait to see if you can get it at two and a half before you play it. And my lean would be to the over, but there's just no value there. Yeah, I, I agree on, uh, I agree on the entire analysis of that. And I know that's not compelling podcast audio, but like, I think Jacksonville is a better team. I, I, I feel like so far this year, RJ, that Miami has probably been overrated. I mean, they were, they were six-point dogs to the Patriots, which was, in hindsight, was, I mean, they almost covered, but really shouldn't have. Uh, and then they were barely dogs to the Bills. And I, I guess that game was in Miami, so I understand that. But, I mean, Buffalo blew them out, and it wasn't remotely close. And now they're just three-point dogs to Jacksonville. I understand Jacksonville is a significant downgrade from – New England and, um, and, and Buffalo, especially defensively. But the Jags can score, and we don't know that Miami can move the ball effectively on a consistent basis. Yeah, I wouldn't call five-and-a-half point dogs at home – you know, on underselling, that's a pretty big number for a home team. And then the, uh, the six points for the Patriots was more about not knowing what we're going to see with Cam Newton. I mean, if we knew sure. the Cam Newton that we were going to get, that line would have been, you know, nine probably, or maybe even 10. Um, so yeah, I think that's more a product of who they've played and uh, in week one. And then that week two line was pretty big and they covered it. You know, um, there's a good stat we'll talk about when we do our full picks pod for the Friday show about zero and two teams against a spread that you want to play in week three. And that does not apply to the Miami here they covered the spread last week even though they lost you know back and forth game with a good buffalo team so um they can score they scored yeah, against they a did. good Wait, did they cover they didn't cover yeah it was a five and a half point spread they lost by three they almost won the game outright the bills had to rally and win at the end um Wait, so I the bills threw a garbage time touchdown to cover last week Why am I no wrong? it was a it was three point miami's one and one against the spread um so they can score points. They were in that game. Um, and part of that was that Buffalo was missing key players in the middle of their defense. Their two, their two best linebackers were out. And that's something you can take into this game because it's not like Jacksonville has great players up and down the defense. So once you weaken that Buffalo defense, Miami was able to, you know, throw some points and run up the score a little bit on them. And uh, Jacksonville, we know, has a weaker defense than Buffalo on all phases of the game. Uh, so Miami should be able to score some points here. That's why you got to lean to the over, um, you know, if you still like it, but don't play it at 48 and a half. Okay, so. It, Miami had a bet. Miami was the one that backdoor covered. It was Buffalo scored. So Miami was winning 20 to 17. And then the Bills were like, bleep it. Let's let Josh Allen throw bombs. And he starts gunning it down the field late in the fourth quarter, which is very surprising. They take the lead 24 20. Then they go up again and they score on the, he threw that bomb to Diggs, And then he hit John Brown for the touchdown on the next play. They go up 31 20. And then, uh, and then, uh, the Dolphins came through the back door, I believe. But I mean, they still covered. You're right. I was, right. I was in my mind. I forgot that they came through the back door. I was thinking, yeah. Was well, as a Bills fan, I was worried about that game because you know we had the delays in that game. Um, yes. So at the end of the third quarter, it was the end of the fourth quarter for the other games. So when Miami went up at the end of the third quarter, yeah. I'm like, oh no, we're going to lose this game, and I had to check myself. Be like, actually, we still got 15 minutes left. <laughs> you know? That's right. That's right. You're right. You're right. Okay. So uh, anyway, sorry that I my head is in a weird space always anyway uh let's take a break and when we come back we'll tell you what props so we're agreement jags in the over but wait and see if you get a better number um two and a half and then you know if the, if the over comes crashing back down maybe take it because we saw that with the bills Bengals. It, it sunk the day of and then it shot up right yeah. before yeah, at some point the sharps got to come in on the under on this so i'm hoping it gets pushed to 47 and a half and then you play the over there okay, but so I, you, would, you would play it at 47 and a half 
I'd play over at 47 and a half, 48 seems like a little bit, you know, too much for me. And then 48 and a half, I'm staying away. Definitely. But, um, so yeah, it's just, it, so if you're somebody who's just itching to bet the game, would you just buy a half a point? Uh, I would just play Jaguars. Um, I think, and then if you, if you do believe that Jags defense is bad and they shouldn't be favored by three on anyone play the money line on Miami. If you want to take Miami, there's no reason to really play plus three when these two, two ugly teams that could give you ugly performance at any time. So I don't mind taking Miami at like plus plus one forty on the money line either, instead of, you know, playing the three and getting a push on the, on the field goal. Okay. Uh, let's take a break. When we come back, we will talk about DFS and player props. Okay. So this is, I saw uh, Mike McClure of Sportsline. I mentioned this on the Pick 6 podcast show, 4 p.m. every single day, except Tuesdays because of Champions League. So Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Come watch it, please. Tune in. Um, LaVisca Chenault over, 36 and a half receiving yards. I, this is a good prop for a number of reasons. I, I, liked it. I liked it as soon as I saw it, and I jumped on it, and I, I agree with it completely, and I think LaVisca is a great uh, option for DFS as well. But there's a very good chance, I think, that we see DJ Chark – uh, maybe not play. He's questionable. And if he doesn't play, then LaVisca is going to get peppered with targets and his over-under is probably going to shoot up uh, around game time to closer to like 50. So uh, to me, 36 and a half here is a slam dunk. Thoughts? Yeah, the only thing you worry about with, with Chenault is they work him in a lot as a running, you know, back two and giving him carries. So if they're, if they're, you know, intent on giving him, say, 12 touches in the game and five of them or six of them are carries, that just makes it a little harder to hit your overs on the – uh on the uh, receiving yards, you know, if you play a, a all-purpose yards or a total yards prop, it, it, you know, it would make a lot more sense to me. It'd be easier to hit because he, I think he had five carries for twenty-something yards last year, last Ooh. week. That's a good point. Uh, all right, what else? Uh, what else are you looking at personally on this game from a prop standpoint? Yeah, I think everybody's going to want to be on overs on Minshew. Um, the one I would worry about is the attempts. I, I believe the number is somewhere in the you know thirty-something range or twenty range. I don't have it right in front of me, but um, I'll look it up as I'm talking. But the thing is, Josh Allen last week had um, 400 and I believe 17 yards or 413 yards and four touchdowns and only threw the ball 24 times. So it's not like you have to throw the ball a ton to move it on Miami. So it is possible that Minshew could have a good statistical game and just not have 35 and a half for his passing attempts. Like he could easily come under that. I believe um, Miami gave up 35 in week one or, um, or, or, you know, against somebody else or Minshew only had 35, I believe is what it was last week, even though he had a good game. So, um, yeah, this isn't, this isn't a place that I'm looking to play Minshew's over. I think I look, I go under on his um, attempts if I'm going either one of these quarterbacks. And I don't trust Fitzpatrick at all in any totals. He could have way over his totals any game. He could have way under his totals any game. So that's kind of where I am on the quarterback. He could rush for 100 yards. He could rush for, like, negative five yards. He could pass for 600 yards. He could pass for 100 yards. Anything is on the table with this guy. Right. And then, so you look at the other players who would you might play and The one I really like is James Robinson going over 65 and a half rushing yards. He's been a key part of this offense so far. He's at 16 carries in each game, averaging 5.1 yards per carry. 16 times five is 80 yards. So he just does that against a bad Miami defense and he's going to get there. Uh, and then running backs totaled 119 rushing yards for the Patriots. No one running back stood out because they split that between four guys. And then the two key uh, Bills running backs rushed for 93 yards in two Miami games. So Miami is more than capable of giving up 90 to 120 rushing yards in a game and if Robinson's getting the bulk of the carries then you have to love him getting over that um Jacksonville's only given two carries to Thompson and we talked about Chark's injury if Chanel does see more receiver work and he goes over that receiving total because they're using him more in that role that just means more carries for Robinson maybe he gets to 20 carries maybe he gets a little bit more than that so I think you have a great shot of hitting on the over on James Robinson so you like Robinson's over on carries and on rushing yards uh, rushing yards for sure. Carries, you know, it'll depend on, it'll dictate the game. If Miami goes up early and Jackson wants to rally back, then, then I think Robinson still has a chance of hitting a big play and getting you over that total, but you might not get all the carries. How high would you go on Robinson rushing yards? I'd probably get up to 75 or so. Okay. I've got 71 and a half. It's, it's gone up a yard in the last like hour. I would, I would bet it gets up closer to 80. It could because yeah, it's just the matchup is so good there. Right. I mean this and you know, when we think about game scripts, we'll talk about DFS too. It's like, in theory, the Jaguars as a three-point favorites at home are going to be, you know, have a lead and be trying to run the ball effectively on Miami. Like, I, I think they – and, Jack, by the way, Jacksonville's offensive line, a little sneaky. Not Playing terrible. Well. Yeah. I mean, L Linder being out hurts, but um, – Linder out, yeah, yeah. but uh, Taylor is coming on nicely. Taylor, it seems like they finally have some continuity. They're not shuffling guys in and out, you know, aside from this injury. Um, so, yeah, it seems like they're all getting used to playing together and they're working well as a unit. And, and Robinson, I think, too, like, 
one of the things for this coaching staff in this front office is after shipping out everybody, it's paramount to show like, hey, we can find young talent. And they have C.J. Henderson, Caleb on Chase on on defense. But if you're like, hey, look, we – like, you know, Tom Coughlin drafted for net, and we can find a running back for nothing. Look at this kid we found in the late round. This kid's a stud. We cut – like, we cut for net, no – NBD. NBD shot and, and Tony, no big deal. It's fine. We got James <laughs> Robinson. Like, you can't – I mean, can't you see that narrative kind of starting to form for, for the Jaguars? And Robinson's found the end zone as well. Um, any thoughts on uh, first touchdown? Yeah, uh, I think Chenault to score the first touchdown. I mean, he had one in the opening game. Um, we think he's going to get more work here if Shark is hurt. So um, Byron Jones is out. If Shark doesn't play, he has a big opportunity. I think you can pair um, – you can also do a uh, – any Chenault scores any touchdown and James Robinson scores any touchdown and get that for plus 600. So if you get one touchdown each from either of those guys in this game, you'll hit at plus 600. I think that's a pretty good value too. Um, and then if you're looking for guys to back on the Dolphins side, I would look at Preston Williams. He has over three and a half catches and over 46 and a half receiving yards. He only had three catches in his two games total, but that's on 12 targets. Um, so I think the production is coming. They're actually going to him a, a decent amount down the field. And um, so he, he sh- once he gets to these better matches, because he played, you know, New England, you know, and those the tough guys there, and then Buffalo. And Jacksonville is obviously a lot easier than that. Um, Isaiah Ford actually has 14 targets in that offense in two weeks. So as things open up for these other receivers, I expect them to start taking some of his targets. So I think Williams can get over his targets as well and might be a sneaky play for some of these first touchdown props and long shot props. Yeah, I like I like Williams a lot. Uh, Forty one and a half, I think I had his over at uh, previously. Let me do a double check on forty five and a half now at uh, at uh, at William Hill. I still like it at forty five and a half though. I mean, this is the game again. The game script. I don't think there's a game script that comes about in this game where the Dolphins aren't throwing some. Right. Yeah, I mean, like they, they're going to be passing the ball at least some. Williams should get over over 50 receiving yards. I bet that up to 50. Uh, all right, let's talk DFS. When we're looking at showdown lineups, uh, I won't mention that I came close to winning with a good amount of money on showdown last week. I won't do that again. But I will tell you that uh, right now, when you go to DraftKings, you're obviously the top. Wow, this is kind of interesting. Do you know who the third most expensive player is behind Minshew and Fitzpatrick is on DraftKings? Is it DJ Chark? It's not. Is it Devontae Parker? You, you probably do know who it is, right? Uh, I don't have it in front of me. I, don't, I didn't it's memorize Tua. it. <laughs> what is Tua Tagovailoa? $15,000 for a captain spot. That's really spicy. Well, just in case he plays, yeah. I mean, you had to, you had to, um, they had to protect themselves when they put those prices out. In the case he gets named the starter, you can't have him down there at the $5,000 range. Right. Well, then, I mean, it's not even protecting themselves. It's more like just protecting the integrity of the, the, exactly. the contest. That's, does somebody know something? That's, that's weird. You never see a backup quarterback that expensive. I mean, like, usually you just make him something in the range of, like, 8000 But maybe they put – although my boy Mike Glennon, 9000 He's yeah, more than Tyler Eifert or Keenan Cole. Look, if you're, he's, not even, if, he's not even on the team. If you're DraftKings, the thing you got to worry about is two is going to get named the starter at some point. You know it's coming. So you have to kind of level, raise his level. I'm guessing level. they put these prices out. I hadn't, I hadn't looked until today because that's just how I operate my showdown. But I'm guessing they put them out a while ago. Uh, DJ Chark, the fourth most expensive for captain at 14-1. Devontae Parker, 12-6. James Robinson, 11-7. Mike Gusecki, 11-1. Miles Gaskin, 10-8. Preston Williams, 10-2. Visca, 9-9. The Jaguars defense, LOL, 9-6. And then Luton, their backup quarterback. This is – man, this is really interesting pricing, RJ, because it – you want to get both quarterbacks, but I think it's going to be really hard to do that and to still fit in – it depends on Chark, I guess. Like if Chark, if Chark is out, then everybody can kind of load up on the cheap. Uh, you can you can easily get a lineup that's um, that's pretty loaded. If Chark is in, I think it's a little more difficult. Yeah, and uh, if Chark is out and they activate D.D. Westbrook, who's been inactive the first two weeks, and you got to look to D.D. Westbrook because he's only $200. And we know that he had a pretty good year last year. He, he was relied on a lot and – you know, he seemed to have a good rapport with uh, Minshew. You know, it didn't seem like there's any reason why he wouldn't throw to him if he gets inserted in this lineup. So if you see that Chark is ruled out, go ahead and throw Westbrook in um, if he's active. And uh, then you can use both quarterbacks with one at captain plus, you know, a Devontae Parker, Preston Williams, James Robinson, however, whatever you want to do the combinations otherwise. You can do a Minshew at captain, Fitzpatrick, 
Mike Gusecki, Preston Williams, James Robinson, and then throw in D.D. Westbrook. If you want – now, obviously, you can't – so you can't get all of those guys and LaVisca Chenault, which is the only problem. But you can do um, – this is actually – this is this is probably the, the chalkiest lineup possible, right? Uh, Minshew captain, Fitz, Chenault, Preston Williams, James Robinson, and then Matt Breida, who's the, the highest available guy you can fit with all those primary guys. Does that seem like that'll be the – uh, maybe. I don't know that Preston Williams is very chalky because he's, you know, three catches and 12 targets. So there might not be people he looking up. absolutely should have had a touchdown. It was a horrific touchdown drop against the – on fourth down and uh, goal against the Bills. Like, mm-hmm. great throw by Fitzpatrick. Easy route, short yardage. I mean, just bring it in and fall in the end zone. And, and all of a sudden, I think people are probably a lot higher on him. So maybe it's a good buy low for him. Yeah, I think it's good by low. I think people will avoid him because of his, you know, three tar- three catches and 12 targets numbers and his, his overall numbers aren't that good. So that's probably the main guy I'm looking to feature him and James Robinson and in all my lineups, whether it's 50-50 or tournaments. Is there any case to be made for going, I guess there, there definitely is a case, but how strong a case would you be willing to make to go with like LaVisca Chenault um, or a Preston Williams as a captain? Um, I, I, my non quarterback captain is going to be James Robinson. I talked about how he could run, you know, run all over them. They're favored in this game. He could get up to 20 carries and it wouldn't shock me, uh, 20 plus carries. And, uh, you know, he's already rushing for five yards a carry and the dolphins are doing terrible against running back. So I'm using James Robinson in my tournament. Um, I think he can have a big game and jump those teams that have Minshew and score more points than Minshew. Um, I do like that Preston Williams as a sleeper, though. Nobody's going to use him. So if you think that he is due and he's going to have a big game against a bad secondary, he's a nice little play there in captain as well. Uh, just looking at potential roster rate for captains, it looks like you can probably expect around 12 to 15% uh, captainship for Minshew and Fitzpatrick. Robinson right around 10% maybe. Shark 8 percent Chark and Devontae Parker around eight percent so I, I do you do you have any concerns about fading Devontae Parker you're right Preston Williams is a sleeper at, at like around six percent yeah you could I mean it depends on how healthy Parker is as well um so but I don't see that he's n- not going to get his it kind of just depends on who's open and who Fitzpatrick tries to throw to so maybe Parker has you know three or four targets just because everybody else is so wide open and it just doesn't happen for him um, so that's the only concern you have to have with Parker because this is a great matchup either way. Yeah. It, it feels like the obvious stack would be Minshew and a pass catcher with Robinson. And then you bring it back with a bunch of dolphins who are going to throw a bombs down the field. I think. And the one thing is you can't use the Jaguars kicker in this game because they put Lambeau on IR and Ooh. the, um, and that happened after they put these numbers out. So they don't have the new kicker on the, on the thing. At least they didn't as of late Wednesday night when I looked. So if you want to have a kicker in this game, you got to have the Miami kicker. <laughs> That might be a concern for the over too. Or does that help the over if they go for it on fourth down? It could. Um, it dep- uh, there's nothing that says this guy's going to miss a lot of kicks, this guy coming in. But Lambo is a good kicker. So maybe if you get one less field goal, then, then an, a number that was going to go over at 49 is all of a sudden like 46, you know, and, and you're screwed. Okay. That's the show. I uh, hope you listen. Brandon Wright, uh, 5,400. But he is on there. They put him on there? They, he wasn't on there as of Wednesday night when I was building my lineups. Diva Diva is the best producer in the game. Like, Diva, like, somebody will say something, and uh, I don't see him. Oh, yeah, Brandon Wright. Yeah, uh, no, 5,400. 5,400 captain. He's uh, 3,600. Brandon Wright um, to, to roster regular. Josh Lambert, 4,400. So there is some value built in there. Yeah, the- I would, I'd go and use that if you're, looking, if you're having trouble, you know, meshing everybody else you want in your lineup. 3,600 is fine for a kicker in a game that should be high scoring. Yeah, that's not a bad, that's not a bad price at all. And people will be people, – I mean, like, I think people will click on and be like, who is that guy? So there's some, uh, there's some potential value there. All right, that is the show. Thanks for listening. RJ, always a pleasure. I will talk to you for our pick show, the White and Tan Pick Show, tomorrow.